I think we're gonna start now. Um, I just want to thank everybody for coming to the AMA with Caleb Maupin. Um, we are gonna have this AMA for an hour or two, depending on the questions and the time and Caleb himself. Um, so if you want to introduce yourself, Caleb, that would be very much appreciated, and then we can take it from there. Sure. I'm a journalist and political analyst. Um, I have written a lot. Uh, I have a book called City Builders and Vandals in Our Age, which is articles and essays on socialism. Uh, my most recent book is called Kamala Harris and the Future of America, an essay in three parts. I'm an anti-imperialist and an advocate of 21st century socialism. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to jump right into it. Uh, we have our first question, which would be from a user named I Bypassed the System. Um, he asks, as concisely as possible, how would you situate yourself politically? Um, I would say that I'm a 21st century socialist, um, and I'm striving to develop a socialism with American characteristics that can help the United States get out of the crisis it's in. Superb. Um... We also have a few questions that are dedicated to you, um, like you personally, um, which is f one of them are from Vinnie the Pooh asks, why did your parents call you Caleb and do you resent them for it? I don't resent them for it, no. Um, you know, my mother is very religious, wanted me to have a religious name. Uh, but they also wanted it to be a unique name. So um, that, that was a name picked from the Old Testament of the Bible. Okay. Um, we have a question from Onan who asks, do you plan on doing more debates with other leftists in the future? Yes, I think so. You know, I was doing quite a bit of them at the beginning of this pandemic, and I'm open to doing it once again. Um, hasn't been one for a little bit, but I'd be happy to do it. I've debated Vosh. I've debated some others. I've debated right-wingers also, uh, and I have no fear about debating the far right. And, you know, I think debate is necessary. I can, I can see that. Um, we have a question from Bo who asks if you're a gamer. I don't play video games, no. Um, but, uh, you know, I, 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 in a way, I kind of feel like I'm, I'm glad that I just never developed that habit. But on the other hand, I know it brings a lot of people pleasure, and I don't want to be judgmental of that. But no, I don't play video games. Okay. Uh, we have another question from I Bypass the System who asks if you agree that communists are a danger to society. No, I would say they're the opposite. Um, I would say those of us who strive for a society where the banks, factories, and major industries and centers of economic power are operated in a way that serve public good and not simply the profits of private owners, I think that that's a good thing um, and that communism offers the hope for the eventual ultimate goal of a world with so much material abundance and prosperity uh, that there will be no need for a government or any coercion of any kind, right, based on vast material abundance. Uh, so I think that, that communists historically have played a very, very good role. I mean, it was communists that built the labor movement. It was communists that fought for the right of women to get to vote. Uh, it was communists who built the civil rights movement long before anyone had heard of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It was communists that were organizing against Jim Crow segregation. Uh, if you look at every progressive struggle that has taken place in the history of the United States or really the history of the world, uh, you can see communists playing a role in it. Communists were key in working with Abraham Lincoln uh, in order to defeat slavery. In fact, there was a communist general in the Union Army named August Willick, and there was Joseph Wedemeyer, who led the Ohio 9th Regiment into battle against slavery. Um, and, you know, Marxists, communists, socialists have always played a very progressive role in U.S. history. I'm sure there have been times where, you know, we could have done better, we made mistakes, but overall, I think communists are something that's absolutely necessary if you want history to keep marching forward, if you want people that are suffering to, uh, to be able to struggle for justice. Communists are always involved. Okay, thank you for the answer. Um, we have a little bit more questions in terms of communism. The next one is from Onan, who asks, despite you saying you're not a gamer, he asks, do you think a successful communist utopia needs to criminalize League of Legends? If not, how do you plan on dealing with the expected mental health issues? I don't know what League of Legends is, but I feel like people should be able to play whatever video game they want to play. 
I would never want video games to be criminalized. I mean, I guess perhaps if the video games were doing something that really did threaten public safety, uh, then then obviously there might be a need to step in. But for the most part, people can play whatever video games they want. I'm actually kind of proud uh, that in Iran, uh, when I visited Iran, I was interviewed by a crew of people that were making a video game. Uh, and it was the first video game ever to have ISIS uh, as the enemy, right? And I, so I was interviewed uh, for this video game. And apparently in this Iranian video game where you fight ISIS, uh, I'm apparently featured as a talking head. So I'm actually kind of proud of myself for that. I'm, I'm featured in the first video game to ever uh, involve fighting ISIS. I think that's neat. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question in regards to communism, which comes from Nan Asami, who asks, what do you think of the school of thought of blankism, blankism? that existed among communist circles in the past? That's uh, Blanqui, I think is how it's pronounced, right? Louis Auguste Blanqui. Probably. Thank you. Yeah, and he was an ultra-left figure, um, and uh, his emphasis was on the seizing of state power. Whereas Marx was saying that socialism is about, you know, building, you know, a mass working class movement, uh, you know, and Blanqui, you know, people jokingly called Louis Auguste Blanqui like the surprise communist. That there'll be just some armed faction that will seize control of the government and then announce to everyone, hey, we're communists and we're going to impose communism on society. Marx argued that no, you know, you know, building a socialist society requires mobilizing millions of people. However, you know, the Blanqui uh, tendency, they were key in building the Paris Commune of 1871. Uh, there were many people that come out of that school of thought that engaged in a lot of heroic activity uh, to, to fight for working families. So I don't want to denigrate them, but ultimately, I think their approach is not correct. And I think that um, many ultra left tendencies in the United States kind of mimic their school of thought. Um, if you look at, you know, you look at some of the Maoist groups, it's not really about class struggle. It's not about economics. It's not about mass movement. It's kind of like we're, gonna, you know, the government is evil now. There's police brutality. There's war as well. We're going to take over the government and make everything better. Uh, you know, and it's that kind of that kind of mentality where it's all just about seizing control of the state and imposing your will by taking control of the state. And I think that that's uh, that's the, the deviation. I know that people compared the weather, the weathermen and the weather underground, that their approach was a little bit blonkiest um, and that they were focused on combating the state and ignoring the economic question. Um, and that Marx's polemics with Louis Auguste Blanqui are very important to read. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there haven't been people, you know, that subscribe to that kind of thought that have done good things. Thank you so much. Um, we have a question from Arbiter George who asks, you have previously affiliated yourself with known fascist and national Bolshevik member Alexander Dugan. Why do you Aff affiliate yourself with such individuals? I don't affiliate myself with such individuals. I went to a conference and I met that individual on one occasion. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't call him a fascist, um, but I, it's not my place to defend him. Uh, he can defend himself. There are things I vehemently disagree with him on, but there are things that are also very interesting in his writing that I would say are, are very astute observations. If you want to understand what he believes, I encourage you to read the book, The Fourth Political Theory. Um, and that puts forward his worldview. Uh, it's a rejection of both communism and fascism. Um, and it's a perspective that I think, in a way, is similar to what most people around the world that are anti-imperialist think right now. Um, and that's why I found his writing to be very insightful. But there are some key questions with which we strongly disagree. But I think he's an important anti-imperialist intellectual in Russia. Um, I don't think he's a fascist, and I think equating him with Adolf Hitler and the Nazis is, is ridiculous. Um, I think he's an important anti-imperialist intellectual in Russia. I'm not ashamed of the fact that I sat down at a meeting where he was and, and spoke, and he spoke, and we talked about the future of populism. Um, you know, but I'm not responsible for everything he said. Just like, you know, I've, I've, been, I've spoken with Donald Trump, the president of the United States, a, a president that I vehemently disagree with. Uh, he, you know, he called on me at a press conference. We had a back and forth. I'm not ashamed of that either. I associate with all kinds of people as a journalist with whom I do not always agree. Um, and that uh, this kind of cancel culture uh, where it's like, oh, this person sat down with this person or this person talked to this person. I'm sorry, but I have sat down with Republicans. I have sat down with anarchists. I have sat down with, with communists. I have sat down with people all across the political spectrum with whom I may agree with, with on some things and may disagree with very strongly on other things. Um, but, you know, Alexander Dugan, he is a Russian intellectual. And again, I would encourage you to actually check out his work and not, you know, rely on what somebody told you based on what somebody told them about somebody who told them that therefore I'm the same as Hitler because I sat down with a Russian guy. You know, that's, that's just silly. Um, and um, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. 
Thank you for clarifying that for us. Uh, Bo asks, is China a fascist nation given its highly racialized policies, its xenophobic character, and its imperialist doctrine? No, I would say that's a huge mischaracterization. Uh, at this point, especially, China is doing everything they can to promote uh, Tibetan culture, to promote the culture of the people in the Uyghur regions. The Chinese government is building mosques. It is building Tibetan Buddhist monasteries. Uh, it is doing a lot to promote the cultures of national minorities. Um, so I just think that's a misrepresentation. It's true that during the Cultural Revolution, there were huge errors made uh, regarding the way religious groups were treated, and that didn't simply apply to Tibetan Buddhists and Muslims. It also applied to Roman Catholics. It also applied to those who adhere to traditional Chinese beliefs. There was a huge and horrendous crackdown uh, and repression of religion during the Cultural Revolution. A lot of religious sites were destroyed. A lot of ancient temples were destroyed, and that was horrendous. And the Chinese Communist Party wrote a very important document talking about how that's not correct. Um, and now uh, the Vatican and the Chinese Communist Party are actually on very good terms with each other. Um, and at this point, like I said before, there are programs where the Chinese government is building traditional Tibetan Buddhist monasteries, building mosques. They have set up Islamic seminaries where, you know, they, yes, they're not going to tolerate uh, terrorism. They're not going to tolerate, uh, you know, uh, forms of Islam that would advocate violently overthrowing the Chinese government. But as far as as Islam that is, that is, you know, in line with building a prosperous society. I, I think that they don't have an issue with that. Now, I have seen reports that in the Uyghur regions, for example, you're not allowed to have a beard uh, because a, a big long beard is considered to be an, a, a jihadist or Islamic symbol. Well, personally, if it were up to me, I personally think that, you know, you should be able to have as long of a beard as you want. At one point in my life, I had a very long beard. I wouldn't have appreciated the government telling me I couldn't do that. It wasn't for a religious reason, but, you know, you know, so is it possible that in some ways, uh, you know, people that are part of China's national minorities are being mistreated right now? Sure. Um, and if that's the case, I oppose that. I oppose all violations of human rights, but I don't trust Western media. And a lot of the reports that have surfaced in Western media have been debunked um, and have, you know, not everything that Western media is saying about uh, about situations in China is true. I mean, for years we heard about, you know, that that all these Chinese people had gathered in Tiananmen Square in 1989 and they were all just run over with tanks and massacred in 1989. Well, now we know that there, you know, that there was a lot of killing in the aftermath of the Tiananmen Square protests, but the actual square was not the site of any of that killing, that there was killing throughout the streets, the, the, the square was cleared peacefully. So this story that we all had about what went on in 1989 that was just promoted all across Western media has been widely debunked and that BBC reporters who were there said that's not what happened. Nicholas Kristof of the New York Times said that's not what happened. Uh, the, uh, the observers from the Pinochet government uh, of Chile said that's not what happened. And now this narrative of the 1989 events and the Tiananmen Square events has been largely ripped to shreds. Um, that yes, yes, there was lots of violence in the aftermath of those protests, but there was not a massacre in the square, right? So, you know, that a lot of times Western media will distort things in regards to China. And we should be aware of that. That doesn't mean we should, we should, you know, apologize for bad things that have gone on, but that means that we should, you know, treat reports in Western media uh, that are, you know, demonizing the Chinese Communist Party with a little bit of suspicion. Um, I don't trust Western media with regards to that. I'm interested in knowing what's actually going on, but I, I don't think that just because some Western media outlet finds somebody who says something that we should just therefore believe it's true. A number of reports have been debunked in regards to this kind of thing. Uh, thank you. On the topic of China, um, Agni Faratis asks, is China socialist and is there democracy in China? I think China is a socialist country um, and, and it's socialist in the sense that the major centers of economic power do not function simply according to what is profitable for their owners. There is a five-year economic plan there is a Chinese Communist Party, there is government-controlled banking, there is a large amount of state-run industries, and the economy functions according to what the Chinese Communist Party wants and what is you know, deemed to be in the interest of all of society. Um, and that, you know, in a lot of ways, uh, the Chinese Communist Party, with its 90 million members, sits at the center of a very highly mobilized and involved population. Uh, the 90 million members of the Chinese Communist Party are in every neighborhood, they're in every school, they're in every workplace, um, and 
they're engaging with people and that people are mobilized and involved in the process of figuring out what China will do. Uh, when they come out with one of their five-year plans, there's a huge amount of input from the population. Now, there certainly are concerns about human rights in China. I would say that the Chinese people at this point don't have the same level of freedom that we have here in the United States, and that's not good. And everyone that I've ever met from China, even the strongest supporter of the government, will say that they would like to improve on that front. They would like to uh, have a better situation regarding human rights, and they are looking to improve all the time. Um, but in terms of democracy, democracy meaning will of the people, uh, you know, rule of the people, the people are heavily involved in the, the process of, of governing the country. I mean, you know, all throughout the country, the Communist Party has clubs and networks. There are associations and assemblies where people are heavily involved in the process of, of enacting policies and, and, you know, enforcing the will of the Chinese Communist Party. So in that sense, there is certainly a level of democracy. I see. Um, Vinnie the Pooh asks, what's your opinion on China banning the teaching of Mongolian in Inner Mongolia? Uh, I don't know if that's true or not. Fair point. Um, so we also have a question um, from Maxi Waxy, who asks, what's your opinion on identity politics? Well, you know, I think a lot of people are political on the basis of their identity. Uh, black nationalists, for example, are, are political on the basis of the fact that they are black and have suffered you know, racism and consider themselves to be a nation. There are many women who are inspired to take action in politics on the basis of their gender or sex. Uh, you know, there are many LGBT people who take action in politics on that basis. And I, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. I mean, the concept of identity politics in and of itself, simply being political on the basis of one identi one's identity is fine. Um, you know, and I, I would never tell somebody that they shouldn't be political on the basis of their identity, their identity as a marginalized person or whatnot. Um, you know, but I think when people criticize identity politics, what they're referring to is the fact that there's kind of a negation of economic class struggle um, and that, uh, that one's identity takes precedence over what policy one advocates. Perhaps there are many people that, that think Kamala Harris is great simply because she's a woman of color, uh, not looking into her history as a prosecutor who destroyed the lives of thousands of people and engaged in prosecutorial misconduct. Uh, you know, and not looking over her history as a person, looking more at her identity than who she is. Um, and so, you know, that's something to be concerned about. And I think when people criticize ID poll or identity politics, that's what they are criticizing. Okay. Um, now that we're on the topic of Kimla Harris, we do have a question from Pro Proconsul Parvati who asks, why do you dislike Kimla Harris? I dislike her because of her record. Um, you know, I mean, she was the queen of mass incarceration in California. And I also dislike her for the fact that she has been selected by one of the most dangerous factions in U.S. politics. Uh, there is a faction in Silicon Valley and on Wall Street uh, that was very supportive of the Hillary Clinton State Department. And they very much wanted Hillary Clinton to wa run once again for president. But when it was made clear that that just wouldn't be tolerated by the population, there were meetings that took place in the Hamptons in Long Island, and Kamala Harris was selected uh, as their candidate. And humanity and, and the global community is still dealing with the horrendous aftermath of the crimes committed by the Hillary Clinton State Department. Uh, you know, they, they turned the Arab Spring into an effort to destabilize countries in the Middle East. Libya was reduced to chaos and destroyed. Uh, Syria was, was you know, uh, un, you know, reduced to civil war, thousands and millions becoming refugees, hundreds of thousands of deaths. Um, you know, I mean, if you look at, you know, the Hillary Clinton State Department and what they did in Honduras, where the military overthrew the elected leader, Manuel Zelaya, and Honduras has, you know, since then had the highest murder rate in the world. And there are refugees pouring into the United States from Honduras at this point. Uh, you know, the damage from that regime change revolution faction, I guess, that seeks to unleash chaos in order to preserve the rule of Western banks and corporations, uh, utilizing social media. Uh, that, that particular faction is very, very dangerous. And there's a reason that Tulsi Gabbard used her limited time on the debate stage to call out Kamala Harris in particular, because there are many people within the U.S. government apparatus, within the Pentagon, within the intelligence agencies, who realize how dangerous that faction really is. I think Obama and Joe Biden realized how dangerous that faction was. You'll remember that Obama replaced Hillary Clinton 
uh, with John Kerry, uh, who became the Secretary of State. And John Kerry did not focus on fomenting revolutions around the world. Instead, he focused on uh, signing the Iran deal and, uh, you know, est- restoring U.S.-Cuba relations. Um, and that, uh, you know, while Obama and Joe Biden and, and a lot of people in the Democratic Party are just kind of regular liberals, there is this bizarre neoconservative permanent revolution faction. They have a lot of support in Silicon Valley, uh, figures like uh, Jared Andrew Cohen, uh, who worked with Google Alphabet uh, and, and also worked with, with the U.S. State Department to carry out these activities. This stuff is very, very dangerous, um, and that this, this particular faction is who Kamala Harris represents. And I'm very concerned about what the implications of, of her becoming vice president and very possibly president, uh, if Joe Biden uh, you know, becomes too old or too tired to, to hold his office, what that could be. Um, you know, she represents something very, very dangerous. Okay, thank you. Um, we actually have a question from quite a lot of our members, uh, one of them being Sasha, who asks, uh, do you vote, um, do you, are you going to vote for Biden? No. Fair point. Um, FK asks, what are the ideas you have for American socialism? Well, socialism in every country has always been unique to that country. And one of my criticisms of people in the United States who are interested in communism or Marxism is that often uh, they find a, a figure throughout history they like, like Che Guevara or Lenin, and they see socialism as kind of imposing this historical figure from some other country's ideas onto the United States. And uh, it becomes almost like, uh, I, I joke about LARPing or live action role play. Um, whereas if you look at you know, the way Mao brought socialism to China was he adjusted socialism to be something that would be in line with China's unique history, China's unique culture, and China's particular, you know, historical circumstances. And that I think in the United States, we need to figure out n- not how we can, you know, try to get Korean socialism to work over here or Venezuelan socialism or Norwegian or Finnish socialism, but rather how we can develop a socialism rooted in our own circumstances and our own conditions. In China, they call their system socialism with Chinese characteristics. And so uh, to be provocative, I say we need to develop a socialism with American characteristics. Uh, One thing that I think is particular uh, about the United States is that we are a very entrepreneurial people. We believe in working hard and getting ahead. um, And we need to find a way that entrepreneurialism and the drive to to work hard and start your own business and all of that can fit in with having a state centrally planned economy. Um, I think that that, you know, and that's something that I think many socialist societies have realized that the old Cold War model uh, of the Soviet Union, where, you know, the government runs absolutely everything is not exactly correct. You know, you don't want the government to run hotels. You don't want the government to run restaurants in Nicaragua. Uh, Their socialist system has been very, very successful because it has a a micro entrepreneurship program where it enables low income Nicaraguans to start their own businesses. um, And those businesses, you know, get a government subsidy and function in line with the overall state central plan. And it's been very effective in raising people in Nicaragua out of poverty. Um, And if you compare Nicaragua and their economy to the economy of Honduras or Guatemala or Mexico or other countries that are essentially U.S. aligned in Central America, it's very clear that the socialist system there has been successful and, and that there will be, I think, a big private sector in American socialism. I think that religion is a very big part of U.S. culture, uh, not just for white Americans, but for black Americans, for Latino Americans, and that I don't think any of the overtly anti-religious tone of some of the socialist societies would ever be tolerated here. Um, I think that there are many people in the United States that are deeply religious that would want to maintain their faith um, and would want to want to be assured that they would have religious freedom. I think freedom of speech and freedom of assembly are very, very important to Americans. But that said, um, I also think uh, that, you know, that 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 the United States is very multicultural and that in a lot of socialist societies, they very much do try to push, you know, you know, one kind of national identity. And I don't think that would work in the United States. I think we would have to have a kind of multicultural state. Um, So there are many things, but ultimately what socialism will be in the United States is something that will develop over the course of struggle. It's not going to happen because I say it. It's going to happen because in the course of fighting for their rights, the working people of the United States are going to begin to develop and build this kind of socialism. And my urging uh, toward you know, leftists in the United States is to actually start moving in that direction. I tell people to get out of the movement and get to the masses. 
that there is a very small group of people in the United States who go to left-wing rallies and left-wing conferences. We need to get out of the, get out of the movement and get to the masses because it's the, only the working people of the United States, the average Americans who are losing their jobs and losing their homes and full of anger at the billionaire banker class that runs this country, it's only them who's going to ultimately be able to build socialism in the United States. So if we continue to isolate ourselves from them, if we continue to see socialism just as kind of our unique personal identity, not as a vehicle for changing society, we're never really going to have an impact. I see. Thank you so much. Um, we had a follow-up question uh, in terms of the Biden one who, that asks, why are you not going to vote for Biden? And also, Ma uh, Magister DiCapri asks, what's your position on Bernie or Bust? Okay, well, first of all, I, I want to be absolutely clear that as a journalist, um, I, and because of my position uh, you know, with RT and such, I do not endorse or campaign for any candidate. Um, you know, so, you know, just, just let me get that to be clear. First of all, uh, if, you know, I, I certainly would not endorse Biden. I'm certainly not going to vote for Biden, uh, because I fear that when Biden takes office, if he wins, uh, that basically what will happen is there will be an effort to nail the door shut to make sure that nothing like Donald Trump or Bernie Sanders could ever happen again, that the mainstream centrist wing of American politics that equates Trump with Bernie Sanders, uh, that that particular wing of American politics will lock the country down and make sure that, uh, that those who want things to change, whether from the right or the left, uh, are unable to do so. And that scares me. And that I think Biden, if you listen to a lot of his criticisms of Trump, it's that Trump is a very selfish person who is putting his own personal interest ahead of the long-term strategic interests of American capitalism and big corporations. And Biden is somebody who is in with uh, the ultra-rich, you know, people talk about the Eastern establishment, the wing of American capital uh, that is thinking long-term about how to roll back the influence of Russia and China, how to gradually decrease living standards both in the developing world and in the United States, um, and how to basically stop historical progress uh, in the name of, of, you know, in the name of opposing global warming, perhaps, or, or environmentalism, but at the end of the day, really about making sure that history stops so that, you know, these certain oil banking elites can stay at the center of the global economy. And that, um, that, that Biden represents, you know, a faction that is in some ways more dangerous than Trump. However, I would not, I'm not voting for Trump either. I mean, Trump is very dangerous also. I mean, what's going on at the border is horrendous. Uh, you know, he says, oh, who built the cages, Joe? Well, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't change the fact that he did horrendous things at the border, right? And that, that, that there are horrendous things being done to immigrant workers right now. Uh, he supports uh, the police right now uh, as the whole country is waking up finally to the horrific reality of police brutality. Donald Trump beats the podium and says, you know, he's for the police and he's for law and order. And, he, you know, this is this is not good. I'm not pro Trump. I'm not pro Biden. Um, you know, I will probably be voting for one of the third parties. And because I do not endorse any candidate, I will not be naming that third party, but I will not be voting for either either of the major candidates. Okay, um, so you also answered some questions that Socrates um, has put in there, um, but he does have one that says, uh, if you're not going to vote for Trump either, do you think Biden would do as much to prevent mass movements as Trump has? Well, if anything, I mean, Trump has emboldened mass movements, right? I mean, everybody's in the street protesting against Donald Trump. And, uh, you know, I think if Biden got in, the Democratic Party would not be so tolerant of left-wing activism and protests. So if that's your concern, you want people to be out in the streets, um, you know, if anything, having Trump in the White House uh, is, is probably the reason that Democrats on a local level in a lot of cities are giving a green light to protests. Uh, many people anticipate that no matter who wins this upcoming election, there will be a big crackdown on demonstrations and such, that right now both sides, both the Democrats and the Republicans, see these protests as useful. Uh, the Democrats see it useful as opposing Trump, riling up their base to oppose Trump, creating the idea that Trump is creating instability. Trump sees it useful as he can say, look, this is the Democrat-run cities. Look, this is the loony left. They're all extremists. They're all communists, and I'm fighting them. Look, I'm sending federal agents to Portland. So they both see a political gain from you know protests and, and people being in the streets right now. 
when the elections are over, I almost feel like there will probably be a consensus from both sides uh, that the protests need to stop and that they there will be a, a crackdown uh, either from a Biden administration or a Trump administration. Um, however, you know, with Trump being in office, uh, the Democrats seem far more interested in protesting and marching with protesters and tolerating protests than ever before. You know, in New York City, uh, the, the district attorney announced there would not be any charges filed against any, uh, any Black Lives Matter protesters. I can guarantee you that that decision by the district attorney would not be made if Donald Trump were not in office. Uh, someone who was part of Occupy Wall Street and, you know, went to court with a number of my friends, I can tell you that, that if Trump were not in office, uh, they would have no problem prosecuting protesters in, in New York City right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Tribune Dax who asks, um, how do you feel about the liberal media covering for Joe Biden's son? Well, I don't know if I would put it that way. Um, it just seems like uh, a decision was made that Joe Biden's son, that that story is off limits. Uh, Twitter and Facebook took their move um, and NPR made their statement that they're not going to cover it. Um, and when they did that, they drew a lot more attention to the story. I'll tell you that much. If the story had just come out, it would have circulated the Trump media. The New York Post covered it. You know, it would have been, you know, it would have been out there. But the fact that there has been so much of this overwhelming, we will not discuss that. Uh, it's kind of like I, I had a friend in college who used to say, how do you get everyone to think about polar bears? Well, you put up signs everywhere that says, don't think about polar bears. Right. And that uh, that this has kind of had the opposite effect. But I think the more concerning thing is that uh, that Silicon Valley, Facebook and Twitter are kind of asserting what they think we should be allowed to discuss and debate. And, um, and that's very concerning because these tech monopolies are not elected um, and they they have a political viewpoint. Uh, that viewpoint, I would say, is is socially liberal um, and they they have decided that they are going to use their position as the tech monopolies to enforce that position. Um, and that disturbs me. Okay. Um, we're going on to another topic uh, now, uh, which is more in terms of your work. So Tribune Anel asks, how did you end up getting your position as Russia Today? Um, well, I worked as a reporter for press TV prior to that, but I was friendly with RT. I mean, for many years I was doing commentary. I was a regular guest and, and, uh, you know, um, uh, I, I was ready to move on from press TV. And so, you know, I applied for a position and opening at RT and I got it. Fair point. Um, we also have a question from Magister de Copper who asks, would you say that RT is more or less uh, biased than other mainstream media today? I'd say it's less biased um, because we're held to a higher standard, right? Uh, we are constantly being, you know, being slandered and accused of being propaganda and all that. So we're constantly fact checking our work. And I would say that we are held to a much higher standard than U.S. mainstream media is because everything we do is kind of under a spotlight and people are always looking to jump and make accusations against us. So we constantly, uh, constantly are very, very careful to make sure that everything we do is accurate. If we make a mistake, which happens, you know, we will correct it. And, uh, you know, I, I just, I think it's the opposite. I think we're held to higher standards than most media is. I mean, CNN, MSNBC, Fox, they do things that are far more biased in nature than, than we do. Okay. Uh, we also have a question from Arbiter George who asks, how much does Russia Today pay you? Well, uh, nothing. I get paid by a production company in the United States. Thank you. Um, Tribune Nell asks, on your website, you stayed under Y. Caleb Maupin, a quote from George Galloway endorsing you. What do you think of this George Galloway quote? We have declared Bradford an Israel free zone. We don't want any Israeli goods. We don't want any Israeli services. We don't want any Israeli academics coming to the university or the college. We don't want any Israeli tourists to come to Bradford, even if any of them had thought of doing so. We reject this illegal, barbarous, savage state that calls itself Israel, and you have to do the same. Well, I mean, that sounds like, uh, like George Galloway is endorsing the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, right? The BDS movement. Um, and he feels that because of Israel's human rights violations, uh, it is necessary for this area, this region to... Uh, to you know, boycott Israel. 
What's interesting is uh, if George Galloway were a, a, a government official in a number of U.S. states right now, that would be illegal and he could lose his job, uh, even if he was a teacher, even if he was a university professor all across the United States. Many states are requiring you to actually sign an oath uh, that you will not boycott Israel across the United States. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I know George Galloway has a long history of, of opposing Israel and criticizing Israel, and I admire that for the most part. I mean, I'm not, I wouldn't necessarily endorse everything he's ever done, but, you know, I think that Israel should be called out. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't see the scandal in that, that quote in particular. Okay, thank you. Um, there is a VC question from Prefect Beholder, Beholder um, about anti-imperialism. Oh, um, yeah. So my question is basically, um, oh, somebody's echoing. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So you describe yourself as an anti-imperialist, and uh, I'm just wondering, like, why are you opposed to imperialism, or uh, and what do you take it to be? Oh, sure. Imperialism is not a verb. Uh, imperialism is not a policy. Imperialism is not something you do. Imperialism is a system. It is a system where corporations and banks based in Western countries dominate the global economy and hold back development in countries across the planet in order to secure their monopoly. Uh, Lenin wrote a very good book called Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. And he described this where, you know, the big Western corporations, they, they dump their excess goods onto developing countries. Developing countries are prevented from developing their own industries and emerging as strong economies that are competitors and are reduced to captive markets, uh, client states, spheres of influence for Western corporations. And, uh, and this, is, this is the reality of the situation. And if you look at all the countries around the world that the United States is targeting, they're all countries that are trying to emerge as competitors. Russia is, it was the top oil and gas producer in the world until the United States surpassed Russia because of fracking, right? Uh, Libya was a major oil exporting state. Iraq was a major oil exporting state. Venezuela is a major oil exporting state. And, you know, the big oil companies that are tied in with the big banks on Wall Street see them as competitors. China used to be the poorest country in the, one of the poorest countries in the world. It was the sick man of Asia. Well, now China makes half the steel in the world. They have the biggest telecommunications manufacturer in the world. Well, imperialism is a process in which countries are destroyed and kept in poverty. And the countries that are being targeted by U.S. foreign policy are countries that have broken out of that system, that have developed their own industries, that have, have, have developed their own economies, and they aren't simply captive markets and client states. Um, uh, you know, when I was a child, I visited Ecuador and I saw Ecuador in 1999. At the time, it was gripped by a horrendous financial crisis because it had basically been forced by the IMF and the World Bank to destroy its own economy and let Western corporations dominate it. Uh, but now, uh, you know, I, I mean, I went back to Ecuador in 2013 after the socialist government of Rafael Correa had been in power for a little while. And what I saw was a completely new country. Um, it was it was amazing because they had seized control of their own economy and started to develop. And that that is what has happened in the 20th century. Russia and China went from being deeply poor countries to being, you know, very powerful, strong world economies, uh, strong economies. And that's why they were targeted for attack. And if you look all over the world, I mean, the goal of, of U.S. military interventions, it tends to, to be, as they say, the gun follows the dollar. And, and U.S. military interventions are conducted to beat down countries that are starting to emerge as competitors and are starting to develop their own, their own center of gravity, their own economic, uh, economic level of development. Uh, they don't want that. Uh, they want countries around the world to stay poor so that Wall Street and London can stay rich. If you want to know what imperialism is, it's keeping the world poor so that Wall Street and London can stay rich. And I'm opposed to that system. And when, when countries break out of that system, I think I that's a good thing. Um, and let me add one more thing, which is for a long time, you know, there, there was what you could call an aristocracy of labor in the United States, which was because the United States was going around the world beating down these, these countries, there developed a very, very prosperous layer of industrial workers in the United States who got paid decent wages and all of that. But now the same thing that the imperialists have done to countries in Africa and Asia and Latin America, they're now doing to parts of the United States like Ohio and Michigan and Iowa and Wisconsin. And that I think that the working people of the United States have a common enemy. And that enemy is the big banks and multi-corporations, the international ruling class 
uh, the big capitalists that dominate the global economy. And I think that all working people in both the first world and the developing world share this common enemy. I understand then that you are against basically the sort of manipulative, capital-driven, um, imperialistic tendencies, right? Um, I mean, of modern so nations. are we having a back and forth? Are we, are we having a back and forth, or is, we this, have, is this the same question, or what's going on? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I was going to ask you another question, right? So then I was going to ask. Um, so. Would you be like against like economic and political intervention in general, or is it just a sort of exploitative imperialism that you're against? I am against imperialism, which is a system, which I just described. I don't like again. Imperialism is not a policy; it is not an action, right? Imperialism is a global economic system, and I am opposed to that global economic system. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we have a few more questions on China and imperialism. Uh, one of them will be, uh, is from Jean, the smoked Oreo, who asks, will China ever be a superpower country like the USA? Well, I think that China is already a superpower country in terms of economy. It plays a very, very big role. Many people have noted that at this point, it seems to have surpassed the United States in terms of productivity. Uh, I think that's probably only because of the pandemic. But you know, China, China has a lot of influence around the world. Um, a lot of a lot of countries do business with China. And I mean, China, China is a superpower in that sense. Um, but uh, I think that China's vision is for a world where countries trade with each other on the basis of win win cooperation. And China becomes wealthier and countries become wealthier by doing business with China. And and countries do not see international relations as a zero-sum game, where one country wins at the expense of another country. Um, and I think that, that China's vision for how the world economy could be restructured uh, as kind of an alternative view of globalization is very, very positive. Okay, thank you. Uh, we also have a question from Onan who asks, how do you reconcile that the way in which China is, in, is a place for Western countries to outsource labor in order to benefit from lower wages seems to indicate a low amount of worker power, mostly mirroring the third world exploitation supported by the obstruction of workers' rights? I think that's a little bit outdated. I think if you had said that in the 1980s, uh, you would probably be on point. Um, but at this point, China has a lot of its own industries and its own corporations. Um, that's not to say that there haven't been bad things that have gone on. And, that you know, I, I like the fact that China is one of the few countries in the world where when the workers go on strike, the government will support them. Um, you know, we heard about some of the horrendous conditions in the Honda factories, in the factories that were owned by uh, the, what is the, the, the company based in Taiwan, uh, Foxconn. But what we didn't hear is about the fact that when workers in those facilities went on strike, the Chinese Communist Party came in and took their side and forced the companies to do what the workers had wanted. And there are many, many instances of that. Um, right now in China, there's a, a huge effort, or I guess there was when the pandemic was more serious and there were more restrictions in place, a huge effort to subsidize the wages of essential workers and delivery workers um, and to support them. And in, in many instances, there were struggles between employers uh, and essential workers and delivery workers, and the government stepped in and forced the companies to do what the workers wanted. Um, and there are many instances of that. Um, you know, the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party uh, often steps in to protect working people and to, you know, control and beat back, uh, you know, big corporations and such. Um, and that corporations in China really live in fear of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, at any point, the Chinese Communist Party could come and show up and say, you know what, you're going to do this. And, you know, you have no private property right. In the United States, you know, if a company is, is producing something and the government says, well, you need to do it differently, uh, they can say, well, this is our company. This is our private property. We can do whatever. Well, not in China. Not in China. In China, uh, in China, the government controls the economy. Many people have noted that, that in reality, it's almost like there's not one square inch of private property in China. I mean, if, you, if something is, is considered to be your property in China, it's because the Communist Party and the state central planners want it to be that. 
um, and the, the Chinese Communist Party controls the economy. And in many, many instances, it controls the economy for the benefit uh, of the population. Now, the main goal of the Chinese Communist Party, especially since the rise of Deng Xiaoping, has been to raise the level of, of abundance and economic productivity. And that has meant you know, bringing in foreign investment, setting up free trade zones, doing things that will enable foreign investment to come into the country. And, and it was necessary to make compromises and it was necessary to let a lot of corporations do things. And that you know, during the Mao era, most of China was living in rural areas uh, that had no running water, that had no electricity. But yes, right, it was more, you know, quote unquote, equal in the sense that, you know, that, that people were, were more closer to each other in income level, but there was widespread poverty. But since that time, the Chinese Communist Party has tightly controlled the coming in of foreign investment and 800 million people have been lifted out of poverty. That is not a small number. Uh, China has built the world's largest telecommunications manufacturer, Huawei Technologies. They have the world's biggest hydroelectrical power plant. They have the fastest trains in the world. All of this is the results of having a state centrally planned economy where profits are not in command and big corporations aren't free to just do whatever they want. Um, and that is that is something we can learn from. I think that socialism has been very successful in China and that the goal of socialism is to increase prosperity in society. Right wingers often will say things like, well, socialists want everyone to be equally poor. Well, no, socialism is about you know striving to make everyone rich um, and trying to create so much abundance in society that we can eventually get to a, a level of prosperity in which the need for state coercion can fade away. Um, and that, you know, that, that during the Mao era, the Gang of Four in particular, they had a, a mindset that argued that you could somehow get to communism or, or get to a higher stage of socialism in poverty and that, that it was not necessary to raise the level of productive forces. Um, and that was incorrect, and that's not Marxist. Marxism is, an, is a materialist ideology. And socialism, you read Frederick Engels' very important pamphlet, Socialism Utopian and Scientific, the goal of socialism is to raise the level of productivity as high as possible. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Arbiter George asks, is China socialist because the workers own the suicide nets on their factories? I... I mean, I don't, that's not a real question. So next question. Fair point. Um, Winnie asks, to what extent do you believe the accusations made about China's treatment of the Uyghurs? I don't ask me to pronounce that. I think I already addressed that. <laughs> I think I already addressed that earlier in an earlier question. So. Okay. Um, reform or revolution? Otherwise, is this a false dichotomy, and why, is asked by Agni Faratis. Okay, well, the thing is, when people think of revolution, they tend to think of violence and destruction. Um, the reality is that genuine Marxists have always advocated a peaceful transition to socialism. A revolution is when society changes from one mode of production and one economic and political system to another. And revolutions come in three stages. Uh, first, you have an economic revolution in which a new mode of production emerges. After that, you have a social revolution in which a new class is created. And then the final stage is a political revolution in which, in which the new class sets up a new state. Um, and that's the three stages that a revolution generally goes through. And humanity has been through this many times, right? The first mode of production was hunter-gatherer civilization um, and, uh, you know, that didn't work out, you know, after, after a while, we got too good at hunting and gathering. There was a scarcity uh, of fruits and nuts to collect. There was a scarcity of, uh, of, of animals to hunt because we were so good at hunting them with our sticks and our rocks. And, and so it became necessary to have a new mode of production, which was called, um, uh, you know, farming. Uh, and so we had the origin of agriculture and that was a new mode of production. And with that new mode of production, there came a new class, people who owned land, right? And declared that this land is theirs because they were farming on it and declared, declared that this livestock was theirs because they owned it. They were a new class. And eventually they set up a new, a new state and they created the state and they created a new state to justify their new political system, which was slavery. Uh, you know, slavery eventually gave way to feudalism. Feudalism eventually gave way to capitalism. And capitalism, I believe, is, is in the process of gradually giving way to socialism. Um, and that this is a process that humanity goes through. And when you say reform or revolution, 
I mean, reform is simply changing the way capitalism works. Revolution would be moving beyond capitalism to a new mode of production, a new political and economic system. So in that sense, I'm for revolution. But I believe in a peaceful transition to socialism. And all responsible revolutionaries have always advocated that. Um, violent revolutions only happen when people are unable to carry out a peaceful transition. Uh, when violence is being rained down on people, their ability to peacefully organize is, is stopped. And in order to defend themselves, uh, they, they engage in violence. And all the revolutions that have happened throughout history that are violent are acts of self-defense. Uh, you know, when the, when the Chinese people had no choice, when the Russian people had no choice, when the people of Cuba had no choice, they took up weapons as a means of self-defense because they could not conduct a peaceful revolution. Um, and that that's very different than what you can call ultra-left adventurism, um, and that is when people go out and commit acts of violence and terrorism uh, with the belief that that'll inspire everyone to rise up or that'll strike fear into the heart of the ruling class or something. Genuine Marxists have always opposed that kind of thing. Uh, the revolutions involve mobilizing millions of people to peacefully organize for their rights and, and try to move society in a good direction. And if they become you know, faced with horrendous violence in response to their peaceful organizing, if they have no choice, if they're up against a wall and, and fighting for their life, at that point, they, they may engage in violence as a way to protect themselves and engage in self-defense. But that's a totally different situation. And that, you know, the reality is the capitalists of this world uh, have no problem resorting to fascism or resorting to establishing an authoritarian military state. And it looks like the people are moving in a peaceful direction towards socialism. You can look at Salvador Allende in Chile. Uh, you can look at the Spanish Civil War and how, you know, the Spanish Republic was very progressive and was moving towards socialism. So General Franco was, was, was brought in and to, to overthrow the Spanish Republic. Even in this country, uh, you know, when it looked like Abraham Lincoln was not going to allow the slaveholders to expand. He wasn't talking about abolishing slavery. He just said he didn't want it to expand to any other states. In response to that, the slaveholders became violent and launched a violent insurrection against the American government. So Lincoln was forced to, to build you know, a, a coalition that included labor unionists, included abolitionists, and included Harriet Tubman, who became the first woman to lead U.S. soldiers into battle. And it was he built a broad coalition to beat back the slaveholders and conduct the second American Revolution, which was the U.S. Civil War. Karl Marx called the U.S. Civil War the second American Revolution. So that violent revolutions are a result of the actions of capitalists when they prevent peaceful revolution. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Onan asks, will you debate socialism done left, a.k.a. commie boy, on reformism? I've never, I don't know who he is, but I, I would be open to that, sure. Cool. Um, Onan also asks, what is your opinion on market socialism as a transitionary stage? Well, I think that there is no set way that socialism has to be. Right. Uh, and, you know, in Russia, they had the new economic policy. Before that, they had war communism. After that, they had socialism in one country and the five year plans. China at this point has a, a, a very market socialist economy and most socialist societies have transitioned to more of a market model. But who's to say that's the only way you should do things? I mean, the question of whether or not a society is socialist is not the question of whether it has a market or not. It's not the question of does the government run everything. It's not a question of, you know, does every factory have an individual council that's autonomous. The question of whether or not socialism is socialism is why is production being carried out? Is production being carried out to make profits for private owners or is production being carried out according to an overall plan for the benefit of all society? If, there, if, if production is being carried out for use, that's socialism. If production is being carried out simply for profit, that's capitalism. Okay, thank you. Um, so Vinnie the Pooh also asks, um, is revolution necessary for the establishment of socialism? I mean, as I, as I emphasized, um, when you talk about revolution, you're simply talking about the transition from one system to another, right? You're not talking about violence. You're not talking about destruction. You're not talking about civil war. You're simply talking about the transition from one system to another. So you're asking me, is, is, the, is, is revolution necessary to move towards socialism? Well, it's like if socialism is one system and it's replacing another, that would by definition be a revolution. Thank you. Uh, Prefect Beholder has a VC question in regards to socialism in America. 
Oh, okay. Um, so my question is basically, um, you talk about uh, socialism with American characteristics, and you talk about American rebirth. Just wondering, could you clear up what those terms mean, um, and why you advocate for them? Oh, sure. Um, well, in terms of socialism with American characteristics, um, that's a provocative term. And it's based on the fact that in China, they call their system socialism with Chinese characteristics. And it is to make the point that every country that has ever adopted socialism has adopted a unique form of socialism that is specifically applied to that country and that country's conditions. And it's trying to make that point. And I'm trying to urge people in the United States who are interested in socialism, maybe they should study North Korea, maybe they should study Cuba, maybe they should study Venezuela, maybe they should study anarchism, uh, maybe they should study social democracy. But I think that if we're going to be serious about getting the United States towards socialism, we can't be uh, we can't be Maoists, we can't be Dengists, uh, we can't be Kimists, um, we can't be uh, Pol Potists, we can't be Bolivarians, we can't be Baathists. We have to develop a form of socialism that is unique to our situation. We should study all the history of socialism around the world and learn from all of it, but blindly follow none of it and develop a unique form of socialism that will work and will be applied to our circumstances. So that's the first thing. The second thing, as far as American rebirth, uh, the United States, let's be real, was founded on slavery, was founded on the genocide of Native Americans. Um, and that, that, you know, there's an optimism that flows through American culture, right? It's like we're always wanting to work hard and get ahead and live your dreams. But there's also, you know, that optimism, that go west young man stuff had a lot of racism tied in with it. And the genocide of Native people and the plunder of Native people and indifference toward other people and, you know, working people to death, building the railroads and the transatlantic slave trade and Jim Crow segregation. That There's so many ugly things in U.S. history. And it's actually interesting. When I was in the Middle East, I learned a lot about Islam and that among Shia Muslims, they have a particular interpretation of the concept of haram, uh, which is, you know, in, in, in Islam, they talk about haram is like if something's sim sinful, it's haram. But in Islam, they say that, you know, that, that, that in, in Shia Islam in particular, they say that, you know, that if, if you um, steal some food and you eat it, it might make you sick. Uh, that if, uh, if you uh, have a loan, you know, to buy a house that, that is an, a violation of the Islamic law, that house might not be safe to live in. It might, you know, catch on fire. Or it might fall down. And that if something is created in an impure way, it is corrupted. I think in legal terms, uh, they talk about fruit of a poison tree. And that, you know, the United States was founded on genocide and was founded on mass murder and was founded on settler colonialism. And that is a curse that hangs over us, you know, and has always hung over us. You know, back in the 1950s, yes, things were very prosperous. Everybody had a house, everybody had a car. Well, I shouldn't say everybody, but among the the white working class, there was a lot of prosperity. But all of those houses, all of those cars were dripping in blood. The blood of not just the Native Americans, the blood of the of the, the black people that were living under Jim Crow segregation, the blood of the Vietnamese people and the Korean people. And that building socialism in the United States will mean that the United States will need to be reborn as a country. And that 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 the way the United States was conceived of as a country is so problematic that we need the whole country to be reborn and reborn on new values like solidarity and brotherhood uh, and kindness and compassion um, and that we need we need to have the whole country basically undergo some kind of spiritual rebirth in order to move away from capitalism and imperialism and that's what my concept of american rebirth really means thank you um Agne Ferratis asks you, uh, is there a place for religion in a socialist society? Under what form would it exist? Oh, I think there absolutely is a place for it. Um, and that the anti-religious stance that many socialist governments have taken has been very problematic and was a big mistake. Um, and that I think that, you know, the reason that there is so much hostility toward religion, uh, you know, in the writings of Karl Marx and in the 20th century revolutions is because under feudalism, uh, religion is not optional. Right. Uh, religion is very much the institution used to prop up feudal relations and that the overthrow of feudalism around the world involved, you know, the triumph of science and reason and freedom of conscience and freedom of religion. So so religion was seen as an institution propping up the old order. Marxists and revolutionaries sought to smash that old institution. 
But now, in our modern world, religion is not, it, it's not like that, right? People have the, the choice to engage in religious practice, uh, to, to attend, to attend uh, religious services, to, to study their religious traditions, and that it has a very different role. And that the strength of Bolivarian socialism in Latin America, the strength of, of various anti-capitalist and revolutionary movements in the Middle East, uh, I mean, I mean, the strength of a lot of these things is their ability to to mobilize people and, and to inspire people on the basis of their faith. And that I think that, yes, there will be a room for religion, a place for religion in an American socialist society. Absolutely. Uh, however, though, um, I think religious freedom will be also very, very essential. Right. And that, uh, you know, the United States, when it was formed, the reason that we put in the U.S. Constitution the, the, the separation clause, right, that there will be no, no law respecting an establishment of religion. Uh, the reason for that was because nine of the 13 colonies had state religions. And so there was a feeling that if we're going to have a federal government. It can't favor one religion over another. And I think that, you know, the United States, because there is so much religious diversity here, uh, that socialism in the United States will, will, while it will embrace and tolerate and allow religion to flourish, it would also respect religious diversity and religious freedom, and religion would never be imposed on anyone. And I think that's, that's very important. I think the American people would never tolerate some kind of theocracy or some kind of religious government. But likewise, they would, they would never tolerate uh, a, a, government, uh, a government that was completely anti-religious or didn't, didn't allow religion to flourish because it's so, so much of a big part of American people's lives. Thank you. Um, we have a VC question from Socialism Done Left. If Socialism Done Left is here. Maybe he done left. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, yeah, shit. I forget I have to unmute people. My bad. I unmuted it. No Thank worries. You. So my question is this. China has wealth inequality that's as bad as the United States and about twice as bad as that of France. China also has income inequality about as bad as the United States and substantially worse than France. And it's also rising faster in China than either of these countries. So in short, why is Chinese socialism, quote unquote, less equal than French social democracy? Okay. Well, first of all, you need to get the word equal out of your head. Uh, when I was in school, I read a book called Animal Farm by George Orwell, and, and it was supposed to be you know, a mockery of the Russian Revolution, and the people who led the revolution said that you know, they wanted to make everyone equal, and that some people were more equal than others, and that you know, was hypocrisy, that's obvious hypocrisy. I was taught in school that communism is when everyone gets paid the exact same wage, no matter how hard they work to make it fair and equal, and it doesn't work because no one ever works, and that this is just, this is... This is, this is the enemies of socialism telling us what socialism is. At no point in the Communist Manifesto does he say we want everyone to be equal, right? And that there is, every socialist society has had wealth inequality and income inequality. Um, you know, the question is sure, to but what But it's never had as degree? income inequality as high as that of China, well, as high as that of the United States. Okay, I, are you done asking your question or do you want to say more? I mean, that's it. Why is this one so high? Like the USSR didn't have this. Why is it different in China? Why is China, why does it, let's put it this way. Do you think that socialism can exist when wealth is as unequally earned, owned as it is in the United States? Do you think that can be feasibly socialist? Um, I don't think socialism has anything to do with equality in wealth or equality in income. I think socialism is about how the means of production function. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. Give me two. So we do have a question from um, one of our prefects named uh, the Red Ace who asks, what foreign languages do you speak? Well, you know, I tell people I am a product of our great American educational system and I do not speak any any language other than English. I did take uh, two years of Spanish in high school and it, it hasn't helped me. I did take a year of French in high school and it hasn't helped me. And I think the fact that we don't you know, teach foreign languages to our children in the United States, especially at a young age, is really awful. And I really regret that. I wish I could speak another language. Um, and um, it's a great point of frustration. And it's, it's basically, you know, we love to joke in the United States about how dumb we are. Right. You know, we see, you know, there's Jimmy Kimmel sketches where like Americans can't find North Korea on a map or can't find their own country on a map. 
we sit there and we go, ha, 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 we're so dumb. Uh, but it's not funny. I mean, it's not funny. I mean, our American education system is so much worse uh, than any other Western country. I mean, we have low test scores in mathematics, low test scores in science. I mean, I mean, it's it's a crime. And I, I wish I could speak another another language, uh, but I can't. And um, and I, I, I think there's a lot of Americans who are in the same boat and they should be angry about this. Um, and that, you know, I mean, you know, this is an argument for why this notion that uh, that that, you know, that you shouldn't have state involvement. Uh, it, it, it's not correct. Uh, you know, it's funny, John Stossel, I remember him, you know, doing documentaries about, yeah, American education is bad and we need more school choice and privatizations. And look at all these other countries in Europe. Well, these other countries in Europe have more state involvement in government, in education. Um, and that, you know, we have for years been experimenting with school choice charter schools, schools for profit. Um, our American educational system is a, is a big source of outrage. I went to school. I, 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 you know, I grew up in a very small town in Ohio. And, uh, you know, I mean, you know, I got, I got the level of education that one gets in a small rural town in Ohio. And um, that shows how unequal the United States is to some degree or other. Um, so, you know, yeah, I mean, um, I wish I spoke more languages than I do. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we have a question from Halloweenus who asks, do you know what dataism is? And if so, what is your take on it? I don't know what dataism is. I mean, is, is that the guy on Star Trek, the robot? I'm just kidding. Uh, but, but no, I, <laughs> dataism, right? I mean, I mean, I know what data is. It's like information, but I, I don't know what dataism is. Good question. Um, if you want to follow it up, uh, Halloween is, you can type it in discussion and I'll make sure. So, okay. He says he doesn't even know what it is himself. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> so I kind of gave up there. Was he, was he hoping I would like fake it and be like, yes, well, I've always been opposed to dataism. I, I was, was he hoping I would bluff it? <laughs> That's funny. Go on. Perhaps. Yeah. Might yeah. be. Okay. <laughs> um, so we have a question from uh, Winnie the Pooh who asks, have you ever tried another style of facial hair? Do you find it that your beard gets you more respect in the industry? Well, yeah, like when I was first doing political things and, and appearing on television, I had a very, very big beard, you know, um, that, you know, was long. Um, and then in uh, 2013, um, I got a haircut, so I had short hair, and then I just did the, like, the, the goatee thing, and that's what I've kind of stuck to. Um, you know, at some point I may shave it all off, um, but we'll see. I mean, I, the goatee seems to work. I've had it since 2013, and it's what I go with these days, yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Scarcia who asks, will Bangladesh become less corrupt under socialism? Um, I think Bangladesh has really suffered as a result of, of, you know, the rule of multinational corporations and the domination by Wall Street and such. And, um, you know, I think that uh, I think that that Bangladesh moving towards socialism would be beneficial for the population. A socialist government could centrally plan the economy, could raise people up out of poverty, and, and could move in a progressive direction. Um, so I know that the issue of Bangladeshi independence was something that, that divided many of the socialist countries. Uh, you know, that China was not in favor of Bangladeshi independence, but, but the Soviet Union was. Um, and that, you know, that that, that was a, an ongoing debate. And that, that when Bangladesh first got independence, it seemed to have more of a kind of social democratic government at, at first like there was some you know there was some five year planning and there were some there was some efforts to try and like cooperate with the socialist bloc and and move in that direction but it, it was always very much a capitalist country and that uh the people there have suffered i mean you should read about some of the stuff that goes on in some of these these factories there and and you know i mean let's remember that you know you know sonar bengal was was what Bangladesh was once called the Golden Bangladesh because they had you know just some of the greatest fabrics in the world. People all over the world were were struggling. Marco Polo and all of them were were shipping Bangladesh's products. But when Bangladesh was colonized, the colonizers destroyed that. Um, just like in India, they destroyed the textile mills, right, and forced them to import their cloth from Britain. Um, and that imperialism does not bring development. That's the most important thing to remember: is imperialism does not bring development. Imperialism is about holding back development, reducing people to poverty, to captive clients. Um, that's what imperialism is. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, so we've been going a bit over an hour now, and I just want to hear if you're fine with continuing. Yeah, I'm having a great time. Couldn't be happy. Okay, great. Um, so we do have a question here um, from Nanasami who asks, regarding North Korea, are its economic and pot- political woes due to the Kim dynasty and Jush? If not, then how can you tell if its situation is due to the Western imperialism and not due to the Jush idea? Well, here's the thing. Um, North Korea's economy prior to the fall of the Soviet Union was actually doing very, very well. Um, and don't take my word for it. You can take you know, the word of the BBC for it. I often quote an article where they refer to the fact that all over the world in the 1970s and 60s, people were studying what they called the North Korean economic miracle. Uh, because they industrialized very rapidly, they electrified the country very rapidly, they did, they had a lot of achievements. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the fall of the Soviet Union devastated North Korea's economy. They had a very efficient food system, but they needed petroleum. Without oil, you know, without, you know, gasoline for their tractors and stuff, they couldn't make their food system work. And after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, there was there was the petrodollar, and it was made impossible for North Korea to get any petroleum. As a result, their food system came to a grinding halt, and millions of people starved to death. They call that the arduous march period, um, you know, and that was particularly horrendous. Um, and that you know, North Korea has has had to have so, you know they had son gun or military first policy. Uh, because there was a real fear that in that moment of weakness after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, that they would be forced, uh, they would be forced uh, to defend themselves in a new Korean War. Um, you know, so I, I think that you know, I mean, is it possible that North Korea's leaders have made bad decisions regarding their economy? Of course. Um, are there policies that they have ha- have that have contributed to their hardship? Sure. Um, but the fact that they are under sanction, uh, the fact that they are they are surrounded, the fact that they 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 are you know they basically they the USA is still at war with them. Uh, you know, Trump said we're not at war. Well, actually, the USA is still at war with North Korea because during the Korean War there was an armistice, but at the end of the Korean War, no treaty was ever signed. And uh, after that armistice, uh, you know, the USA has never recognized the government of North Korea. Um, and there still are large amounts of U.S. troops in South Korea. Uh, you know, the war games they do rehearsing the all-out invasion of North Korea that go on, these very provocative, provocative war games that are happening. And, uh, you know, North Korea, th- those folks have suffered, and they are, they are locked down and they are ready to fight. Um, you know, I mean, millions, probably three to four million Korean people died during the Korean War. And, you know, the Korean War might be an ancient memory for those of us living in the United States, but for the Korean people, it's, it's a reality they are very well aware of, that every building over one story tall was bombed during the Korean War. Um, you know, then there's the, what went on in the 1990s, what they call the arduous march period, where the country was subjected to just, you know, horrific economic suffering due to the fall of the Soviet Union and crippling U.S. sanctions. And... I mean, the North Koreans are fighting for their lives. And under such circumstances, countries are not the free and open societies that they would like to be. Um, You know, when a country is that desperate and fighting for its life, you get lots of militarism, you get lots of authoritarianism, you get, you know, personality cults that are very extreme. These are mechanisms that, that, you know, societies, you know, use to hold themselves together in the face of dire circumstances. I think North Korea wants to open up. They want to economically open up. They want to do what Deng Xiaoping did in the 1980s. Um, and, uh, I think that that would be in everyone's interest. I think that would be good for the United States. It would be good for Russia. It'd be good for China. It'd be good for South Korea. Um, and in order for that to happen, North Korea needs to give up its nuclear weapons. Uh, the nuclear non-proliferation treaty is very important to Russia, China, and the United States. And so if the sanctions are ever going to be lifted, if North Korea is ever going to be able to economically prosper, it will need to give up its nuclear weapons. For North Korea to give up its nuclear weapons, it would need some kind of assurance that it would then not face an all-out onslaught, you know, an invasion from the United States or from the South. Um, and so my hope is that what Donald Trump started and what seems to have ended, uh, can somehow get going again. The process of North Korea negotiating the, uh, the surrender of its nuclear weapons and the rejoining of the non-proliferation treaty can be carried out, that North Korea can give up its nuclear weapons, that it can join the global economy, and it can have an economic boom. I think that would be good for everyone in the world, and I hope that that is able to happen. It seems the process has slowed down and, or, or basically stopped, but my hope is that whether it's Biden or Trump, or whoever gets into office next, they can get that going once again. Okay, thank you so much. Um, 
So Spartacus asks, what is your opinion on Korean reunification if you support it? Under what conditions would you want would you, would you want it to take place? Like I said, I mean, um, in terms of Korean reunification, right, which is now, I mean, I was just talking about the condition of North Korea opening up, giving up their nuclear weapons, etc. But, you know, uh, Korean reunification, I would favor peaceful, peaceful, democratic reunification of the Korean Peninsula, um, in which, you know, a, a government for the entire peninsula was established in which all parties were allowed to take place, to take part, right, that the Korean Workers Party should be allowed to run in, you know, peninsula wide elections, as should the parties that, that are very big in the South. Um, and that's what that's what sparked the Korean War was that, you know, the idea was there were going to be peninsula wide elections after after the end of the Second World War. Uh, there were two governments that were set up on the peninsula, but there were supposed to be free elections. Well, you know, the government in the South declared there were not going to be continent wide elections. And then when the people in the South who were sympathetic to socialism and Marxism or, or just, you know, anti imperialist or whatever, uh, when they protested for such things, they were massacred in big numbers at Cheju Island and elsewhere. And so it was in response to, you know, the shutting down of the democratic rights of their country folk in the South uh, that, that the Korean War began uh, after a number of massacres in which U.S. troops as well as, as Korean troops participated in the massacre of Koreans who tried to protest for democratic rights. Uh, that's when the Korean War was launched, and the Korean War was a horrendous war in which which many, many people, millions of people died. Uh, what the Korean people have been through is absolutely horrendous. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a, a people that have been subject to just extreme humiliation, uh, you know, where the, the imperialists have, have divided their country, and, and it, it's awful, right? And the fact that during the Olympic Games, uh, when that unified Korean team came out in South Korea, you know, the whole auditorium just cheered and applauded for them. Uh, that shows that the Korean people very much feel that they are one people, right? There are two governments, but there are one people. Um, and I think that what has been done to the Korean people is horrendous. And I would like to see peaceful, democratic reunification of the Korean peninsula at some point. Yes. Okay. Uh, so Prosper asks, do you truly think that a war between the West and North Korea will happen? West? Yeah, the West, like... Oh, uh, oh okay, I thought... I was the thinking, West. Okay, because I'm not like... <laughs> I'm like, I know about South Korea, but West Korea, I've never heard of. No, no. Um, no, I hope, it, I hope it wouldn't happen. I, I think the people of the South don't want it. Um, uh, the people of, of the Southern regions don't want it, and uh, the people of the North certainly don't want it. Um, and, that you know, when, when the Park government was forced out and Moon Jae-in took office, that was seen as a step toward peace, because I think the people of the Korean Peninsula overwhelmingly want peace. And, um, you know, I, I think that that would not happen. Okay. Well, talking about the West, I think we're going to move to that a little bit. Um, so Bo asks, do you think Margaret Thatcher made a critical mistake in the manner she privatized railroads in the UK? Well, I don't think it's a matter of a mistake. Um, I think it's that, that this was this was neoliberalism. Right. Um, that, you know, after the post-war economic expansion ended, uh, there was a real push in Western countries to push neoliberal free market economics. And part of that in, in Britain was privatizing a lot of things that have been nationalized after the Second World War. Um, in the United States, it took the form of a war on labor unions. You know, in Britain, during the Thatcher administration, you had the miners strike that went on for two years. Because in the United States, the labor movement is significantly weaker. We had, uh, we had the PATCO incident where, you know, President Reagan uh, fired all the air traffic controllers um, and that it was about weakening the power of organized labor. It was about, you know, cutting back and rolling back the welfare state um, and uh, strengthening the, the rule of multinational corporations. And, and you know, Thatcher and Reagan uh, played a role in that. I think Carter kind of set the stage for a lot of that, you know, before... Reagan came in and did it, and that this was part of the turning point, and that after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, especially in the 90s, under Blair in Britain, under Bill Clinton in the United States, we saw, you know, the left-wing parties kind of go along with this kind of thinking as well, and neoliberalism became the dominant school of thought in terms of economics, this idea that it's always better if the government doesn't do it, uh, you know, the only role for the government is to facilitate the free market, um, you know, that kind of thinking took dominance in the Western countries and it had a horrendous, horrendous result. Um, and the world is still reeling. And, and Bolivarianism in Latin America and the rise of Russia's President Vladimir Putin, both of them are really a response to neoliberalism. Neoliberalism in Eastern Europe and in Russia after the fall of the USSR, neoliberalism in Latin America killed millions of people. 
Okay, that I'm not exaggerating there. I mean, I mean the result of shock therapy economics that Naomi Klein talks about in her book The Shock Doctrine, uh, that Philip Thayer talks about in his book Europe since 1989. The result of those policies was mass death, and the people of Russia, the people of Latin America, the peoples of Eastern Europe, they opposed these policies that were killing them. That you know, economists like Anders Gunder Frank referred to as economic genocide. Right. And and very much, you know, the rise of Bolivarianism, the rise of Vladimir Putin, they they are a response to the failure of neoliberal economics. And I think the rise of Trump and the rise of Bernie Sanders in the United States is also a fail, a response to the failure of neoliberal economics. OK, so we also have a question about Margaret Thatcher from Winnie the Pooh, who asks, given the huge amount of control over industry that the British government held before Margaret Thatcher's reign, do you think that Britain could have been reasonably called socialist in that era? No, uh, because the state was heavily involved, but the state was simply functioning to as kind of the facilitating the flow of profits into the hands of, of big global corporations based in Britain. Right. You know, state ownership or state involvement in and of itself is not the definition of socialism. There are many countries around the world where the government is heavily involved, but the government is simply securing the flow of profits into the hands of private corporations. Um, you know, Saudi Arabia, almost everything is run by the government. But you, I mean, Saudi Arabia is not planning the economy on behalf of the population. The, the Saudi government is facilitating the making of money by the Saudi royal family, by the bin Laden family, which has a state monopoly on construction, and other wealthy families. The state is heavily involved, and, and there's a level of what you can call bonapartism, where you know, certain sections of the ruling class have a lot of power. Um, but that is not socialism. Singapore, uh, Taiwan, uh, you know, a lot of, the, you know, South Korea for a long time uh, during the Park government in, in the 70s uh, and 60s, you know, uh, you know, that, that it, you, there can be a lot of government involvement in the economy. But if the government is simply helping to facilitate the flow of profits into the hands of corporations, is simply facilitating production organized for profit, uh, that is not socialism. Okay, fair point. Um, we do have a follow-up question in regards to the potential reunification of North and South Korea. Bougie asks, are there some aspects the country sh could or should learn from the German reunification, uh, such as implementation of the North Korean household, debts, ETC? I don't think so. I think it's a completely different situation. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Rab Manej asks, apologies if this has been asked already, but are you optimistic about Aris's election in Bolivia? I remember seeing a headline in the Wash Post declaring him a neoliberal in socialist clothes. I am very optimistic about it because I don't think that's that's the case. Um, and that I think that, you know, the the government of Bolivia under Evo Morales, uh, you know, was very much a socialist government. And that, yes, I mean, they brought in foreign investment. But, you know, if you listen to some of the interviews that were given, uh, you know, uh, by him and by people from the Morales government, it's very clear they were planning to they were planning to facilitate Bolivia's economic growth, uh, you know, with state control and state central planning. Um, and that's why the government was overthrown. I mean, the highest rate of GDP growth in all of South America prior to the coup in which Morales was overthrown was in Bolivia. Um, and, you know, we always hear in the United States about, oh, Venezuela, they have socialism and it's so awful. Well, Bolivia had the highest rate of GDP growth of any country in the entire continent. And they never said, oh, look, socialism did it, right? The coverage in the United States media uh, of, uh, of topics related to socialism is very, very selective. Um, Bolivia has been very, very successful. Bolivia had a socialist government and, and has just elected them back into power. And Venezuela has a socialist government, but Venezuela's economy is centered around oil and Bolivia's economy is not. And that's a pretty big difference. Okay, I see. Um, so Winnie the Pooh asks, what is your opinion on the elections in Belarus and Lukashenko's repression of the subsequent pro protests against the result? Well, I know there's a lot of corruption in Belarus. Um, there's a lot of young people who feel like the government there is not listening to their concerns, and I hope that the government there can have dialogue with them. But I think it's important to note that the government of Lukashenko, uh, by maintaining a socialist economic system, um, by not, you know, privatizing everything after the fall of the Soviet Union, by maintaining, like, you know, central planning, has 
has, you know, provided a layer of social safety and economic security that was much greater than most countries, you know, in the former Soviet Union endured. And that, that there is a very big, there is a big economic benefit to the policies of, of the Lukashenko government. Um, you know, that they, and th- this is like, you know, I mean, Bloomberg News and others have run articles about this. I mean, in recent months, you know, prior to that, that election, uh, you know, you know, Belarus was moving in a kind of anti-Russian direction and was was getting more, you know, more friendly to the West. And so because of that, uh, you know, there was kind of an opening and we saw a lot of articles in U.S. media praising the economic achievements of the Lukashenko government because they have been very successful in in, you know, in in raising productive forces and, you know, providing jobs and education. I mean, the population there has been well taken care of. That said, there's a lot of corruption there. There's a lot of particularly young people who are angry with with how they've been treated um, and I hope that the government uh, can continue to have dialogue with the protesters and that they can, you know, carry out reforms that will make everyone happy. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Nanasami asks, was the interference of the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe and Afghanistan of an imperialist nature or was it different? Well, it, it, well I, I wouldn't say it was an, of an imperialist nature. I think it was it was done because these places were being actively destabilized as a threat to the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, in Afghanistan, you know, you had the Sour Revolution of 1978, where, I mean, it was it was a preemptive revolution. I mean, there were many, many people within the government of Afghanistan who were pro-Soviet. And, you know, I, we have now learned that Zbigniew Brzezinski set up what he called the Afghan trap. And it was basically, he set up a situation where the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan would have to take power in order to not be massacred. Right. He was basically, you know, it was it was, you know, the the right wing in Afghanistan was getting ready to slaughter all the pro-Soviet or anti-imperialist folks in the government. So they had no choice but to take power. But they took power kind of preemptively Um, and that, you know, it was the Afghan trap because immediately after they they took power an insurgency among the deeply religious folks in the countryside started. Uh, We now know that, you know, the CIA and Saudi Arabia were were working to facilitate, you know, you know, the, the figures like Osama bin Laden you know, going there and building this kind of Wahhabi fanatical army and that that the whole plan with Afghanistan was to give the Soviet Union its own Vietnam. That was what the plan was. Um, and it worked. Um, and, and the Soviet Union, you know, spent lots of money and lost a lot of lives in Afghanistan trying to trying to keep the People's Democratic Party in power uh, when, you know, it had been forced to preemptively take power to avoid being massacred. And there's a huge gap I mean, still today, between the the rural population of Afghanistan and the folks in the cities, and uh, that was exploited, and that this was this is this was a big new Brzezinski strategy, right? Let's you know they they saw what happened with the Vietnam War, where people all over the world were sympathizing with the Vietnamese peasantry uh, as they fought against uh, the United States, and so you know the aesthetics of the Afghan War were very much made for television. It's been revealed mind you, uh, that CBS News aired staged battle footage from the Afghan war. You can Google this, that that battle footage from the Afghan war that was not real, that was staged like Hollywood was set up to make the Mujahideen uh, look like romantic freedom fighters, Um, that there was even a, a James Bond movie, The Living Daylights, that ended with this movie is dedicated to the brave Mujahideen fighters of Afghanistan. And that that everything was done with the intention of trying to give the Soviet Union a Vietnam. That's what this big new Brzezinski was trying to do. Um, and with regards to Eastern Europe, um, you know, there was a lot of effort made to try and get, you know, various governments throughout Eastern Europe to, you know, get further away from the Soviet Union. It was the events of, you know, the Prague Spring in Czechoslovakia. There were the, you know, other events that happened, Poland, uh, Hungary in 1956. And, and this was this was about fomenting unrest to try and destabilize that region, overturn socialism, open the door to Western corporations. Not that the Soviet Union never did anything bad in these countries, which, I mean, the Soviet Union, there were many examples of them operating in a way that was problematic. Um, so it's a complex situation. But ultimately, Zbigniew Brzezinski, who was, you know, I mean, he was the national security advisor to Jimmy Carter. He was, you know, the, the, the probably the most well-known Cold War strategist other than Henry Kissinger. He realized that it was far more effective to get communists to kill other communists than it was to have Western capitalism just full on attack communists. Um, And that staging these kind of, uh, you know, conflicts uh, where, you know, you have like the government of Dubček in Czechoslovakia, 
you know, coming to power and, and destabilizing and, and, you know, you know, fomenting kind of anti-Soviet sentiment and or where you have, you know, the situation in Afghanistan that staging these kind of conflicts was much more effective in weakening the Soviet Union and that this was part of the strategy of the United States and that, you know, there were many people who marched in the Prague Spring who really did want a more democratic form of socialism, a socialism with a human face. And I think they were very frustrated with how the socialist system in Czechoslovakia was set up and they had very legitimate grievances. But as we learned, especially in 1989 and 1990 and 1991, we learned that these, you know, these movements for a more humane form of socialism, these movements for quote unquote democratic socialism, uh, that they, these protest movements, they were set up by people who didn't believe in any kind of socialism and believed in shock therapy economics. And, you know, in country after country where these kind of these idealistic young people marching for freedom would, would you know, march and protest, there would then be a coup. And then a pro-U.S. government would come in and the country would be economically looted and, and people would die and sex trafficking would expand and the heroin trade would come in. And the 1990s in Eastern Europe was a disaster. And that I think a lot of people that were young and had real frustrations with, with the Marxist-Leninist states and wanted more freedom for freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, artistic freedom, were duped and taken advantage of. Um, and uh, and that's, that's kind of what happened. And the Soviet Union intervened uh, to try and prevent that from happening, right? And trying to keep the socialist system intact. And, you know, one of the, you know, it's, it's interesting, there's a slur or a word they use for young communists uh, that, that are, you know, you know, supporters of various socialist countries that have existed. They call them tankies. And what that comes from is the fact that in Western media, the way Soviet military interventions were always portrayed is with tanks, right? Uh, there's actually a book called Washington's Secret War in Afghanistan where Philip Bonosky, who was in who was in Kabul at the time of, of the Soviet troops arriving, talks about how there was one tank in a park in Kabul, but every Western media TV camera was pointed and just surrounding this one tank because that was the way the narrative was to be portrayed. The Soviet Union was to be portrayed as cold, mechanical, grinding, scary, you know, military vehicles. Whereas, you know, in Czechoslovakia, in Poland, in Romania, in Hungary, there were actual people in Afghanistan who supported socialism, right? In Afghanistan, it wasn't just cold, hard tanks that opposed Osama bin Laden. It was women who wanted the chance to read, you know? It was, it was, it was women who didn't like having acid poured on their faces, uh, you know, if they weren't wearing a headscarf. Uh, it was intellectuals who believed in socialism. It was impoverished people who wanted to see their country industrialized and get electricity. And that, that no, the pro-Soviet side of the Afghan war wasn't just some big, scary, sci-fi looking mechanical piece of technology. And the same goes for Hungary. Uh, and the same goes for Czechoslovakia. In Hungary, uh, one of the main leaders of the uprising against the Soviet Union was, uh, was a cardinal who had, had been very sympathetic to Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. Um, and that among the uh, among the the anti-Soviet, you know, you know, rebellion that took place in 1956, there was a very, very big anti-Semitic current and that a lot of Jews were targeted with hate crimes because the the anti-communists who led the 1956 revolt in Hungary believed that communism was a Jewish conspiracy. They were fascists. They were not advocates of democracy. They were fascists. Um, and that there's a long history of this um, and that that people look at these conflicts the way American media portrays it. There are these peace-loving, freedom-loving people who just want democracy. And then there was the evil Soviet tank on the other side. And that is a huge, huge oversimplification. Uh, when it does come to tanky uh, stuff, um, Nana Sami asks, how do you address the accusations of being a tanky, as in somebody who defends authoritarian socialist slash third world regimes, but not authoritarian uh, capitalist regimes or Western imperialism? Well, I don't, I'm not like personally insulted by the label. Um, you know, I mean, it's just a term that gets thrown around um, and it is what it is. But at the same time, you know, I don't think anyone should blindly defend any government or regime. I think we should always be open to criticism, always admit the shortcomings of any society. Um, but I do think that the countries around the world that have tried to build socialism uh, have had a lot of successes and those successes never get uh, never get discussed and, and are never openly permitted to be in the discourse. I learned my whole life that socialism has failed everywhere it's ever been tried. Everywhere they tried to have socialism, it failed because it doesn't work. And I will never forget the day that I went to the library and I got a copy of a book called The Revolution Betrayed by Leon Trotsky. And I wanted to read this book because I knew that Trotsky was somebody that Stalin had killed 
And the title, the title of the book was The Revolution Betrayed, so it was going to be about how the Soviet Union was not really socialist, so maybe there would be another type of socialism that would work. And I opened this book, The Revolution Betrayed by Trotsky, and the first chapter was called What Has Been Achieved. And it was all statistics about the economic achievements of the Soviet Union. It was about how much you know, wheat they were producing, how many tractors they were producing, how much steel they were producing, the amount of you know, electricity, the, the electrification of the country. And I was reading this and I was in shock because I had been told my whole life that the Soviet Union had never had any economic successes. And I looked at this book by Trotsky and I thought, this can't be true. You know, this has to just be communist propaganda because everyone knows the Soviet Union, they were poor and starving and miserable the whole time because communism just doesn't work as an economic system. So I went and, you know, this was, you know, the Internet wasn't as widely accessible. There was something called the World Book Encyclopedia. And there was a chapter, you know, there was a section in the World Book Encyclopedia on the Soviet Union, and it had a section on the economy. And I read in the World Book Encyclopedia that the Soviet Union had had huge economic achievements, industrializing the whole country, electrifying the country. And I was like, what? Like, I had been lied to. And everywhere I went in U.S. society, I would hear this. Communism has never worked anywhere. And, and that's a lie. It's just a big lie. And it comes up in every debate and every discussion. You know, at the debate recently between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, um, you know, Donald Trump said, you know, to Joe Biden, you want socialist health care. You want social, you know, and, and what he's doing there is he's dog whistling this narrative people have in their head that anything that is socialist doesn't work. And that's a lie. Socialism has had huge successes. Problems? Sure. But but you have to be a tanky, basically, if you're going to talk about socialism in the United States, because until you get over that lie that socialism has been a big disaster everywhere it's ever been tried, you can't talk about socialism. And, and all economic discourse in the United States is premised on that big lie. And the lie is not that socialism never had problems. The, 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 the lie is not that socialism, you know, didn't, you didn't have the fall of the Soviet Union. The lie is that socialism that socialism has never had any economic successes and it does not work as an economic system. And that is so obviously false. If you look at the history of China, if you look at the achievements of Cuba compared to other you know, Caribbean islands like the Dominican Republic, like Haiti, like, like Jamaica, you know, uh, I mean, it, it is so obviously false, this narrative that socialism has failed everywhere it's ever been tried. It is ridiculous. It is, it is what you can call a big lie. You know, the Nazis, Joseph Goebbels, Hitler, they had this concept of the big lie, that if you really want people to believe a lie, you tell a lie that is so big. You don't tell a little lie. You tell a lie that is so big that people just can't even comprehend that you would lie so big that they believe it, right? That you'd lie big. You say something that is so, so far from the truth that people will believe it because they can't comprehend someone being that dishonest. That's what this narrative about the history of socialism is. It is a big lie. It is a lie that is so, so far from the truth. Uh, I mean, it's, it's just, it shocks the nerves. China, the Soviet Union, Cuba, these countries had huge economic achievements in addition to their problems. And if you can't, if you can't acknowledge that fact, you just need to stop talking about socialism. So if, if acknowledging that makes you a tanky, uh, guilty as charged. Thank you so much for your answer. Um, your average frog asks, I don't know if this has been asked already, but where do you think we are most likely to see a socialist revolution next? <laughs> well, you know, I have no crystal ball. Um, and that, uh, you know, socialist revolutions don't come from the skies. They don't just fall from the skies. They, they are rooted in real material conditions. And uh, I think there, there are a lot of countries around the world uh, where the people want more economic prosperity. And I think that, you know, that China's influence around the world in terms of being a prosperous country to trade with uh, is leading many countries to want more economic independence. Um, so, you know, I think there is a prosperous anti-imperialist socialist bloc around the world, the Bolivarian countries, uh, you know, the, you know, the, you know, you know, the rise of China, Vietnam, and, and that more countries will, will join the socialist camp and will start moving in that direction. Um, but we don't know necessarily where it will come from and that not everywhere is socialism ideologically the same. You know, there are socialist countries that are deeply religious. There are socialist countries that are hardline dialectical materialist atheists uh you know there are there are different forms of socialism in the world today and um i think that that we really don't know where it'll come from but it but it when it does come it will be rooted in material necessity it'll be the people wanting to take control of their country and and move forward and and change the economic foundations of society okay 
Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Java Boogie uh, who asks, do you disavow uh, Russia Today propagating the QAnon uh, conspiracy theory? Next question, please. Deal. We have a question from Bo who asks, how the fuck are we going to deal with climate change? Easy. Uh, well, not easy. I, mean, I shouldn't say easy. Well, forgive me. I should not have said easy. But, but, but the answer to climate change is historical progress. We have to move forward. We have to move beyond fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are the problem creating climate change. And that the prevailing view of how to deal with climate change is a pessimistic view. The primary, the primary view of dealing with climate change is we need to reduce human consumption. We need to reduce the human population. We need to lower global living standards. We need to transition to uh, lower energy levels. And that is a pessimistic view. And the, the answer is we have to get out of the prison for humanity called fossil fuels. And China and Russia are both calling for international cooperation around fusion energy research. research. That is the future. Humanity does not move backward, right? And the idea that we're just going to reduce consumption, that's not how human beings work. Humans want growth. They want to live better than their parents did. Uh, parents want their children to live better than they did. Uh, humans are always inventing new things. They're getting to a higher mode of production. So the notion that we are going to solve climate change by moving backward uh, and reducing you know, energy consumption, energy output, uh, energy flux density, uh, it's wrong, right? We need to, we need to, we absolutely need to move beyond fossil fuels. Uh, the oil-based global order is a prison for humanity. We need fusion energy now. That's why China, you know, did their recent mission to the far side of the moon. That was to acquire helium-3, which is a, an element that is very rare on this planet, but is very abundant on the far side of the moon, which is key in fusion energy. We need fusion energy more than ever. Uh, we cannot remain an oil-based global order. We need a higher mode, not, you know, solar panels are great, you know, uh, you know wind turbines are great, but they're not the answer. We have to get off of fossil fuels. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Magister DiCaprio asks, what is the most flagrant illustration of the Western media misrepresenting what happens in Russia or China? A recent example, if possible. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I can give many, many examples. I mean, there are just, there are many, many, it's, I'm, I'm trying to think. I mean, you know, I was in Russia during the elections and, uh, you know, I saw for myself that, you know, Putin is very popular and that, you know, there were other parties. I was embedded with the Communist Party on election night. And, you know, that's another party and they participate in the elections. And, you know, if you watch American media, you would get the impression that Russia is some kind of absolute dictatorship where no one's ever allowed to criticize the government. And that is just not true. Um, you know, I mean, with regards to China, I mean, there are I mean, there are constant distortions. Um I, I'm, I mean, I can think of many things that come to mind. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm telling you how Russia's elections were portrayed in the United States versus what I witnessed when I was there. Um, you can talk about China's role in the South China Sea, right? You would get the impression that China is just being authoritarian and trying to control territory because they're an empire or something, ignoring the fact that China depends on oil imports. They need oil uh, for their economy and that, that, that oil comes from the, you know, from oil tankers in the South China Sea. Um, and so, you know, China beefing up its military presence in the South China Sea is about making sure those oil tankers don't get messed with. And the USA having a big presence in the South China Sea is about threatening China and telling China that at some point the United States could stop, uh, you know, could, could, could try to intervene and stop oil tankers from coming in, right? And so the idea that China is somehow being imperialist by, by building up its presence in the South China Sea I mean, I'm sorry, how would we feel if there was a huge Chinese presence in, in the Gulf of Mexico? We wouldn't be okay with that, especially if we depended on key commodities coming in on ships through the, through the Gulf of Mexico. Um, you know, this is just one example. Um, the fact that, you know, the United States is giving all kinds of weapons to Taiwan right now. Um, and, you know, that's being portrayed as, oh, Taiwan has to defend itself because, you know, well, no, there is a, there is a very, very anti-Chinese you know, anti-mainland government. Taiwan is China, but there's an anti-mainland government, uh, you know, you know, based in Taiwan. Uh, and the United States, by, by pouring weapons into Taiwan, is escalating the tensions there. Um, there are many examples of this, um, but I, mean, I guess those are some examples that come to mind immediately when you ask. 
Okay. Uh, we also have a question from Bo uh, that is a VC question regarding Russia and China. So I will unmute him and he can ask his question. There you go. Um, sorry, I was eating. I was just eating chips. So <laughs> forgive me. Um, uh, given that uh, Russia, the Russian state has incredible power and connections to business conglomerates. Is not the current structure of Russia incredibly similar to China? Um, what makes one socialist and the other not besides intent? Since it doesn't seem like either um, have decreased wealth inequality. Well, um, as I said, uh, inequality is not the measure of whether or not a society is socialist or not. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, but furthermore, what is uh, for the society, whether or not a society is socialist is based on why is production carried out? Is production carried out simply to make profits for owners or is production forced by the state to work in the interest of all society? Um, so and, what, and, what, what, what I, I just give me a, some sort of metric that I can that I can tell I can you can ask me or you can tell somebody, sorry, that will like be able to distinguish Russian like dominated industries by you know uh, by the government and chinese dominated industries in the, by the government like well actually what, i think that yeah. you know russia's current economic model is very much inspired by deng xiaoping um and that's widely okay. acknowledged um that that in the 1990s uh, as putin was looking to take office uh in, and restructure russia's economy around oil and gas uh, that that a lot of extensive studies of the Deng Xiaoping market reforms and the Chinese economic model were carried out, um, and that's there's no question about that. Um, and that you know that that there is heavy state involvement in Russia's economy, no doubt about it. Now, Russia, they do not consider themselves to be a socialist society. They they are adamant that they say that they are very much a a capitalist society, but that the state you know protects the interests of the country as, as overall um, and. You know, that's that is their position. And I'm not going to step in and declare them to be something that they they do not feel that they are. Um, but uh, but there is heavy state involvement in the Russian economy um, and the, the Russian economy is centered around the state uh, for sure. And it's very much I, I met people have pointed out that, there, that there's actually in terms of just direct state ownership. I think there's more state ownership in, in, in terms of percentage in Russia than there is in China at this point. Um, so, uh, yeah. And that, you know, there were a lot of things, you know that were not privatized during the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, you know, and that, that there is a, a layer of Russian society, of people in the military and people in Russian civil society who maybe they stopped believing in Marxism and they rejected the Marxist ideology uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, but they, they still maintained a level of hostility, you know, toward the West. And they, they were very, very opposed to what the West was doing in Russia at the time of the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, and they, they, they opposed the Western economic model. They opposed shock therapy economics. And that I think you can interpret the current Russian government a, as that, um, you know, it's certainly not socialist in the way the Soviet Union was. Um, and it, it certainly didn't transition to become the way it is, the way China did. Uh, there was a, a capitalist counter-revolution that was very bloody and, and had horrendous effects. But, um, you know, I, I, I don't, when you look at Russia's economy today, I don't think you can call it fully capitalist. Okay, thanks. Okay, super. Uh, we do have one more question about uh, the whole Russia thing from Andrew Popa 2.0, who asks, what do you think about the cooperation United Russia has with far-right parties in Europe? Um, well, I don't know to what extent that's really true. Um, you know, I think that there are a lot of, there are, I mean, it's complicated. So, you know, I mean, Russia is under attack. I mean, it's subject to sanctions by the United States. I mean, there was the whole situation with Ukraine and there, there's just, I mean, a constant, you know, level against Russia. And I, if I were in charge of Russia, I would want to make alliances with people in Western countries and, and make friends with people in Western countries who might be more sympathetic. Now, I don't know to what degree what you're saying there is true. Um, because there's a lot of, you know, we've been told that Russia rigged our elections in the United States and got Donald Trump elected. That's ridiculous. You know, that's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, you know, I mean, we've been told that, you know, that Russia is responsible for every right wing or racist thing people say on the internet. That's ridiculous. Um, you know, so I, I don't know to what extent what you're alleging is actually true, but, you know, um, I will say that, you know, at the time of the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, 
you know, the left fell on its face. Um, you know, I mean, uh, and in fact, you know, this would be a good point. You know, it should be pointed out that, you know, this term red brown alliance, which gets used a lot on the Internet in discourse when attacking leftists who defend Russia, uh, this term red brown alliance, where did it come from? Well, it came from the fact that after the fall of the Soviet Union, the Boris Yeltsin government was imposing economic austerity on the country, looting the country and creating an economic catastrophe. And so the Russian people went to the polls and they elected a Duma, a parliament that was made up of the Communist Party, but also some nationalist parties that opposed the economic looting of the country. And in response to that, um, Boris Yeltsin used his emergency powers to dissolve the parliament and the parliament then refused to leave. So the military was sent in and 187 people were killed in the streets of Russia fighting against austerity and, and all these economic problems that happened. Now, you would think, you know, with all the communist parties that exist in the United States, with all the communist parties that exist in Britain, with all the communist parties that exist in France and Germany and, and various places, when you have, you know, an elected government that has come in that is fighting austerity and the communist party is major and is part of it, you would think that they would pour into the streets to protest in support of, of the Russian people against what's being done to their elected government. They didn't do that. The memo got sent out all across the United States, in Britain, as in France, that this government in Russia, in the parliament, this, this elected parliament in Russia, was a, quote, red-brown alliance. And it is true that there were people in that government who said anti-Semitic things, and I don't, I don't endorse that. I'm not for any kind of racism or bigotry. Um, but based on the fact that, that this anti-austerity government that was elected by the Russian people to resist austerity and shock therapy, Western economics, Based on the fact that it was labeled as a red-brown alliance, the left in the West sat on, its, sat on its hands and did not protest during the events of what they call like Black September, now in Russia, the constitutional crisis of 1993. And the left became so compromised and so confused and so, I, I don't know what, what you want to call it, politically correct or, or, or distant from the Soviet Union. You know, you had the rise of Euro communism in, in, in the late 70s and, and, you know, like the French Communist Party, the Spanish Communist Party cutting their ties with the Soviet Union. But the organized political left, uh, you know, which, which in theory should have been aligned with the Soviet Union, uh, you know, was not. Um, and that allowed a lot of the horrendous things that happened in Russia uh, during the during the fall of the Soviet Union. So, you know, again, I'm 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 simply speaking, you know, I'm simply I'm not speaking about anything I know. I'm speaking about what I might do if I were hypothetically in the situation, right? Under such circumstances, would it make sense that 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 a country that has seen the left completely, you know, stab them in the back and fall on its face might hypothetically make allies in other parts of the political spectrum? Is that possible? Maybe. I don't know. I, I really don't know. I think that it's overblown. I think the notion that, you know, you can't, first of all, when you use the word far right, right, what immediately comes to my mind is Nazis. You cannot be a Russian patriot or a supporter of Russia and be a Nazi, right? Hitler killed 26 million Russians, okay? The, the defeat of the Nazis is one of the greatest points of pride in, in that country, and I've seen it. Uh, so, so uh, you know, the idea that, that Russia is funding or supporting Nazis or aligned with Nazis, I find that to be very hard to believe. But are there kind of, you know, perhaps people that are not on the left um, that, 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 that Russia has had developed a relationship with? I, I mean, I think that that's certainly possible. Um, and based on the fact that the left seems to have failed so much and seems to have been so thoroughly compromised and that revealed itself so badly at the time of the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, that kind of thing makes a little bit of sense to me. But I don't, I don't, again, I'm not speaking to anything I know. I'm just, you know, I'm being, uh, what's the term? I'm, I'm being, uh, I'm speculating, so to speak. Okay, thank you. So we're getting really close to the two hour mark, which means we need to round it up. So okay. I was thinking if you'd be okay with like some uh, quick, relaxing, fun questions. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so I bypassed the system asks, who is the hottest US president? <laughs> um, well, uh, every US president has been a man and I am heterosexual. So I, 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 I can't really give an answer to that question. You do have a point. Um, so, Bo asks, is Elon Musk secretly a Marxist? No. Um, he also asks, what do you think of Trudeau? I'm not a fan of his policies in Canada. Fair point. 
Uh, Rosalind J asks, what's your favorite anime? I'm not into anime. Um, you know, uh, I think I had a friend oh, in college God. who showed me a movie called Spirited Away that she really liked. And it was okay. I enjoyed it. I think that's a classic anime, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is very classic. Uh, glad you liked it. Um, <laughs> so Bo asks, what's your ELO on chess.com? What's my what? Uh, your, I think it's what's your rank on chess.com. But oh, I'm not sure you do it. Yeah, I, I play chess at about a level five. Um, you know, I, I'm not good at chess, um, but that's why I do it, right? Um, because it's like I feel like, you know, you know, I've never been good at chess, and that's why I should do it because the part of my mind that, that doesn't have those particular skills, whether it's, you know, spatial reasoning or whatever, is the part of my mind I want to develop. So, you know, uh, to quote President Kennedy, I do these things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. And I encourage people to do that. You know, if you're not good at chess, play internet chess. If you're, uh, you know, if, uh, if, if, if there's something that, you know, that you're not particularly knowledgeable about, learn about it, right? That, that look, for, look for the weaknesses uh, of, of your mind, of your life, and, and develop them and build on them and seek to improve yourself. So that's why I play internet chess. I'm not very good at it. It's also a way to pass the time in the dull hours of the pandemic. That's pretty cool, though. So Vinny the Pooh asks, who has been the hottest first lady? Oh, oh, well, as much as I don't agree with her or her husband, I would say Melania for sure. I suppose, I suppose. Also, they really want to know this. So I assume you have to start uh, gaming because Prosper really wants to know what's your favorite video game. Oh, well, I, like I said, I just I don't game, so I, I can't answer the question, unfortunately. I do remember when I was a, a kid, I had an, uh, an uncle and he had the game Doom on his computer. And, and so whenever we would go to visit him, I would get to play Doom on his computer. And that was like, and my mother did not approve of that. So my brother and I, we would like, we would like secretly go play Doom on his computer. And that was like our little like video game rebellion. So maybe Doom, how's that? That's kind of cute. Um, so we have a, a short question here. Who's your favorite philosopher and it can't be a Marxist? Oh, uh, it would definitely be Socrates. Um, and, uh, you know, Plato's account of Socrates' death, the Phaedo, always brings tears to my eyes. Um, and it is one of the most beautiful texts um, when you read about how Socrates was dying and what he was telling his followers uh, on the brink of his death. It is one of the most beautiful texts I've ever read. Okay, that's super cool. Uh, I need to know, what's your favorite animal? Um, I don't know. Um, I mean, dogs are cute, um, so I guess I'll go with dogs. That's nice. Um, and with that, I think we're going to round off the AMA. And I want to thank you so much for coming and being our guest. And I hope that you enjoyed the AMA and all of the questions that the audience asked. Yeah, sure. It was great. Um, people should check out my book, The Three Bullies and Vandals in Our Age, uh, More and More for the Future of America. And I'm live on YouTube all the time these days. So if you ever want to get on YouTube and uh, engage with us, we, we talk about all kinds of stuff. So feel free to check out my Yeah, very well said. And we enjoyed it very much.